Hello. Uh, Vinita, ma'am, can we start? Ah, uh, yes. We can start. Okay, thank you. Um, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We, uh, others will. Yeah, well, we have some of our participants who have joined. We, the others are joining as well. So we can start. It's already three past five. Yes. Uh, good evening to all is the ladies this, and gentlemen. Is there any problem of network today? Uh, I believe there is little lagging. We can't hear you. Am I audible? Yes. So on behalf of their policy yes, center, audible, but the speed is a little fast. On behalf of their policy center, Ocean Governance and International Ocean Institute, I welcome you all for this fifth batch of Ocean Academy course, Ocean Literacy, Know Your Planet Beyond the Land. A warm welcome to our course educator and guide, Mr. Sunil Murlidhar Shastri, the director, IOI India Ocean Academy, Mr. Kosman, International Ocean Institute, Malta, and a founder director of their policy center, Dr. Vinita Apte. Welcome all. A special mention of Ms. Antonella Vesalo, managing director of International Ocean Institute, Malta. Uh, Madam, due to her prior uh, commitments, she could not be present today. And a very special welcome to all the participants who have joined us here. Thank you for making it possible. The ocean, vast and mighty, covers more than 70% of the planet's surface, shaping our climate, providing sustenance, and fostering life in the depth. Yet, despite its immense importance, our understanding of ocean remains limited. Today marks the pivotal moment as we gather here to embark on the journey started two years back, commemorating the World Water Day. Their policy center has partnered with International Ocean Institute and IOI Ocean Academy India program to conduct this online academy courses in India. An IOI Ocean Academy course is designed to upgrade the ocean literacy by providing an understanding of regionally and locally relevant ocean information at an appropriate level. IOI Ocean Academy program under its title, Ocean Literacy, Know Your Planet Beyond the Land is a 10 day course and it's starting from today. To know more about this, I request Dr. Vinita Apte the founder director of their policy center to address the participants. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Sneha, for the nice introduction. Uh, very uh, feeling very nice to see Sunil Shastri and Kosmin, all, all the participants. Uh, most welcome. I really don't want to talk much when uh, these courses have start because this is our fifth course. And the fourth are already very successful courses, which we got a very good feedback. And these courses we have started because um, this International Ocean Institute and other people, they want to uh, give a good scenario of the ocean. Because for in, in our vision, in the common man's vision, ocean is just for to uh, look at it, go there, have fishing, and then have fun over it. But there is a vast meaning of ocean and especially in the environmental field. It's like one family, one earth, one ocean is now, it has started that you, uh, people are people are started learning about it. And that is our main uh, object uh, for the common people as well as the researchers. They also, uh, they also know beyond the ocean uh, in such kind of courses. And these all are webinars. So uh, it's easy to attend. 
it's all over nation we are running it and uh, this india chapter is leading by my friend and uh, our co director sunil murlidhar shastri who has been uh, in the ocean since his childhood means since his childhood he might not be in, uh, staying near ocean but after that once he completed his iit he was totally engrossed for the ocean and that is why his knowledge and his experience give a very good uh, object to the learners uh, how you can see what is the vision uh, looking at the ocean so over to you sneha now because i am always eager to listen uh, uh, sunil ji's deliberations uh, which is always give a good good insight and it's a learning process so cosmin welcome for this uh, first inaugural training course uh, and now over to you sneha thanks a lot thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, moving further i'll request cosmin to kindly address the audience over to you cosmin hi uh, good afternoon everyone nice to virtually meet you uh, thank you very much for your messages uh, sunil vinita and for the introduction sneha uh, it's uh, with great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth i believe program of uh, the uh, ioi uh, ocean academy india program it's uh, it's great that again we gather here and are reminded about the profound importance of our oceans and uh, also how the IOI has uh, uh, contributed to this basically we've been founded in 1972 by uh, professor elizabeth memborgese and we operate as an independent non-governmental non-profit organization conducting training and capacity building in ocean government since uh, 2021, uh, on our 50th anniversary, we began uh, the ocean literacy program called the Ocean uh, IOI Ocean Academy. Uh, we've offered more than 70 courses in, I believe, 15 or so languages to roughly 4,000 people so far. So I'm very happy to so you join this course as well and uh, as you embark on this uh, educational voyage i really hope these meetings will be guided by the spirit of collaboration between you and uh, also the lecturers i think they're gonna guide you and they're gonna tell you feel free to ask your questions and uh, uh, there's also something to be said not only learning from uh, uh, the people lecturing you, but also learning from uh, each other. With this, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Koshman. Uh, thank you for encouraging and motivating, supporting us on these. Thank you. In the learning process, an educator plays an important role. And we are fortunate to have with us Mr. Sunil Molidhar Shastri. Sir is a consultant, an expert, a speaker in the ocean and environment governance. In 1982, he found his basem under the tutelage of Elizabeth Mann Borghese and has since then made it his passion. He is best known internationally for his master class in ocean and environmental governance. In the past, Sir has been an academic and a researcher in the mining and ocean engineering. He is also a Rotary International Paul Head Fellow. He was born in India in 1955 and has lived in the UK since 1988 with his wife and son. So I request you to address the audience and as well commence the course. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you very much. Thank you very kindly for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Cosmin, for being here. Uh, Cosmin Q is, uh, in fact, at the backbone of uh, whatever goes on in the International Ocean Institute at the headquarters, and he has been a great support support to us. Uh, it's also lovely to see Vinita. Uh, we, we meet each other, we meet each other, uh, you know, personally as often as we can. Uh, it's also good to see her always online, and it's it's a pleasant presence at, at all times and an inspiring presence too. Um, 
I have to say very quickly that uh, Vinita was very kind when he when she said that you know I have been in the oceans right from my childhood. That's a bit of bit of an exaggeration or a poetic license because obviously Vinita and I have been working together for a long time, uh, and we appreciate each other's professionalism, etc. So she's she's entitled to that little bit of poetic license. But as um, as Cosmin mentioned, that the IOI was founded in 1972 by Elizabeth Manborghese. And I had the good fortune to be introduced to her 10 years later in 1982. So I can say that since 1982, I have been, uh, you know, in, sort of uh, in this business of Pacham in Maribus uh, through her influence, uh, Peace in the Ocean. Uh, and I have been excited about doing what I do since 1982 on a literally on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the support I get from the International Ocean Institute, from the Managing Director, Antonella Vasalo, uh, from Cosmin Q, uh, and our new partner. So as, as uh, we mentioned earlier, as Sneha mentioned earlier, uh, and Cosmin mentioned too, that in 2021, we started the Ocean Literacy Program under the IOI Ocean Academy, the International Ocean Institute Academy, Ocean Academy. And uh, we were looking for a partner uh, in India to start the IOI Ocean Academy in India. Uh, and it was my good fortune uh, that I met my old friend Vinita Apte and uh, I explained to her what the idea was. Uh, essentially, the main thing about this program is that uh, it is offered uh, free of cost to all the participants. So there's no cost to be borne. There is 20 hours of uh, uh, literacy sessions uh, divided into 10 sessions. And this happens, uh, Lavelle, we've been doing this in 2022 and 2023. Uh, twice a year. We might do it again, maybe two or three times this year, and so on. We'll carry on doing it, uh, you know, uh, in perpetuity as it were. And this is all thanks to the support that we get from the International Ocean Institute uh, in, 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 in every, every possible way that we can conceive of. And uh, it, it is important, of course, that uh, we have a local partner here in Tair Policy Center, uh, headed by Dr. Vinita Apte, and not to mention, uh, you know, her her young and enthusiastic team, uh, of which Sneha uh, is an important part. So this whole thing has worked together. The International Ocean Institute uh, asking me to do this, and then I sort of uh, requesting Vinita to be our partner, and so this whole tripartite agreement, as it were, or tripartite uh, tripartite activity, has worked fantastically. Uh, for the last two years, and uh, long may it continue. And uh, let me uh, stop here in terms of the inaugural side. Uh, I thank Cosmin for being here, and uh, as always for, uh, uh, you know, Sneha for organizing things uh, in a seamless manner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, briefing and as well as always supporting and encouraging us. Thank you. Uh, so I'll permit you to uh, share the screen so that I can start with the session. Okay, that'll be good. Right. So can you see the screen? Yes, sir. It's visible. And, and you can see me and you can hear me. Yes, sir. Thank you. So let me let me make a start. So thank you all. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name shows up at the bottom of my, uh, my face, uh, at the bottom of my screen. So hopefully you can see that. So as, we, as I mentioned, uh, here we have three logos. The, in fact, four logos in a way, but there's the International Ocean Institute with the with the dove of peace. So the whole motto of International Ocean Institute is Pachim in Maribus, which is peace in the ocean. Uh, on the right side of that is the new logo of the International Ocean Institute, the IOI Ocean Academy. 
and then to the left, uh, to the bottom left is Care Policy Center, uh, which is head, headed by uh, Dr. Vinita Apte, who is the founder and director of the Care Policy Center. And uh, right to the right is my own logo, which is the Ocean and Environmental Governance. I just want to uh, take you through through my logo. If you see, there are six circles at the bottom of the uh, logo. The first one uh, uh, depicts people. So th there's like a, a two adults and a child. So it's uh, it's people. And then the next to it next to it is the is the planet. Uh, and I have chosen the Pacific view of the planet to show how big the ocean there is. We'll talk about that more. Uh, the third one is profit or prosperity. And that is signified in pounds and euros and dollars and rupees or whatever you like to call it. So that's people, planet and profit or prosperity. So those are the three stools on which we sit. And these three stools have got to be equally justified uh, in order to progress to what, what I have got in the next three circles, which is equity or equitable distribution of resources uh, uh, to, to the mankind. Uh, which was the whole idea behind uh, Elizabeth Mann Borghese uh, starting with the Ocean International Ocean Institute. The next being uh, justice, the, the, the balance signifies the justice. So justice uh, in terms of environmental justice, economic justice, social justice, and so on. And finally, peace. And again, the dove, dove of peace, which is there in the International Ocean Institute logo, has also been uh, reproduced there in a somewhat different uh, angle. So people, planet, profit, leading. So people, planet, and profit being the three-legged stools, uh, which lead. If you if you look at them carefully, if you if you balance them carefully, as it were, then that those will lead to equity and justice, and eventually to peace. So that's the whole idea and the ethos with which uh, I have uh, worked since 1982. So now it's 42 years since I first started. Uh, in this in this area, um, so let me uh, and today of course is the is the first session uh, and uh, uh, Sneha will of course tell you what's happening uh, uh, every every day about what's going to happen the next day uh, and we we are going to have this program until the first of uh, April uh, because we have a bank holiday or a holiday in between on the day of Holi which is on the twenty fifth of uh, March. So other than that, we will have these 10 sessions Monday to Friday. Okay. And the first session today is going to be kind of ocean in simple terms. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, a very, very cursory and a very simple, uh, simplistic overview of the ocean is what I'm going to do today. So I, I start with this classic uh, photograph and it is called Earthrise. And this may not come to you as a surprise. Uh, some of you might have already seen this photograph and some, some of you may, may not have, and I, I will very try, try, try to uh, quickly explain the importance or the significance of this, of this photograph. Uh, Earthrise, the name itself is, is quite unique in the sense that we have, from the beginning of mankind, uh, we have man, women have been, men and women have been observing sunrise and moonrise. And that's, that's what, in fact, dictates our lives. Uh, the sunrise and the sunset decides our day. We get up in the morning. We go to sleep at night. We work during the day or do whatever uh, you know, productive things that we do. We do those during the day. And we, we sleep at night. And the moon also rises and sets. And that sets the tides. And uh, a lot of people, we, we, we always talk about solar energy. And uh, the whole idea of tides also working in this very rhythmic fashion, uh, you know, twice a day, they can also be the source of energy and lunar energy. I mean, nobody really talks of lunar energy, but actually it is as important as solar energy. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that as we, as we go through this program. Now, the, the title Earthrise signifies that nobody ever thought of Earthrise we talk of we thought of sunrise and moonrise because we live on the earth and nobody had ever left the earth you know so this earthrise photo was only possible because the apollo 8 mission which took the astronauts into the into the orbit of the moon they could take the picture 
of the Earth rise. So you can see at the bottom of the picture is the Moon's surface, and the 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 the, or, the Apollo eight, you know, lunar lunar module is going around the Moon, and while it's going around the Moon, they suddenly observe this this thing rising up, as if sun rises or the moon rises. And that's why they called it the earth rise picture. And there are there are a, very many version, versions of this picture. And uh, of course, this is only half the earth visible. There are some which were taken later on. They show the entire earth in the sense the entire circle, uh, not just semicircle, almost a semicircle that we can see here. And that picture signifies how blue the planet is. So somebody has even commented that why do we call the planet call this the planet Earth when we should be calling this planet planet water or blue planet, you know? And that's what I, I want to talk about it. The emphasis of all the ten sessions that we are going to do is the ocean, the blue planet, and so on. But let me just sort of get, give you the flavor of things that are going to come. So what this William Anders did on the what what you call as Christmas Eve of 1968 was take this picture with his camera that he had available. And he said, actually, that we set out to explore the moon and instead discovered the Earth. You know, so, well, we always knew the Earth was, a, the, the, discovering the Earth is a different thing. It's a way of saying things. But we never knew Earth as a whole, as, as one, because we have only seen patchworks of Earth from our own perspective, from, from our own narrow perspective or small perspective. But this is the first time somebody was ever able to take a photo of the Earth as a unified whole, just as we see sun or the, the sun or the moon or the stars in the sky. So this is the unique picture in that in that respect. And he says that we discovered the Earth. And there's a famous environmental photo, uh, photographer called Galen Rowell. And he said that this is the most, uh, most influential environmental photograph ever taken. The reason is this picture was taken in 1968, and I urge you to see uh, in on the YouTube. There is there'll be a uh, if you if you Google it, if you Google Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan, and look for pale blue dot, the pale blue dot. So if you look for look on YouTube for the play pale blue blue dot by Carl Sagan, you will understand the importance of this uh, picture because what. What William Anders said is that I, if I could put my thumb in front of my camera, I could obliterate the entire Earth. And that gives you, the, on the one hand, the fragility, idea of the fragility of the planet that we live in. And of course, for us, that's the only world we know. That's the only world we know. For us, it is the greatest thing that we have. But it is also the smallest thing as far as the universe is concerned. And which is why I urge you to read this, uh, to, to, to watch this YouTube video by Carl Sagan uh, uh, called The Pale Blue Dot. So let's, let's progress from there and remember this picture in your mind. Uh, right, okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is, so just, as I said, that this is the greatest thing that we know. The Earth is the greatest single thing that we know because that's the entirety of our world, our entire history, our entire humanity, our entire culture, our entire, uh, you know, technology, science, whatever you like to call it, art and architecture and everything. It's all there. There's no other planet for us. That's the only place. That's our home. And that's the only home we have. So similarly, our idea at the International Ocean Institute and people like me who work in the area of ocean and environmental governance. For us, there is only one ocean, and I will come to that in a little bit. But let me talk about uh, talk a little bit about this concept of one ocean, although we talk in terms of several oceans. So the concept of one ocean is critical or crucial to everything that we do. We have always been taught in history that there are three oceans, some people say, Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Then you might say that there are five if you add the Southern and the Arctic to it. So that can make it five. And if you split the Atl Atlantic and Pacific into North and South, then you have seven oceans. So people talk in terms of three, five or seven oceans. But really speaking, 
there is only one ocean, just as we have only one planet. Now, of course, uh, I have recently heard it said, and I, I, it really amuses me that we spend billions, and it is worth noting actually this particular quote, and it says, we spend billions and billions to discover or to find life on another planet. So we know the, all these stories about people wanting to go to Mars, et cetera, et cetera. And we've been spending billions to do that. Of course, there's nothing wrong in scientific research and knowing about the universe around us. But while we do that to find life on another planet, we are spending billions and billions to destroy life on our own planet. How, what sort of a conundrum is that? So we are on the one hand, we are spending billions to find life on, on another planet and with dif great difficulty, we might find it. And, you know, they, they may well be life on another planet, but then we are spending billions and billions to kill the life on the planet that we already have. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So just as we have one planet, I told, told you that there's only one Earth that we have. We have just one planet, so similarly, there is only <coughs> one ocean. Now, how big the ocean is? How big is the ocean? So the Pacific alone, which is one of the three oceans, as it were, that we name, and I would try to use the word ocean in singular as much as possible, unless I have to talk in terms of these three oceans or five oceans, but really, ocean is singular entity. The Pacific Ocean itself is much larger than the entire surface area of the Mars. So now Mars is the planet that we are trying to find life on. But the Pacific itself has got an area that is larger than the surface area of Mars. So that's, that's how big the ocean is and that's how big our planet is. Five moons, five moons can be placed side by side across the Pacific. Side, five moons, you can put, and there'll, there'll be still a little bit of space left between, uh, between two edges of Pacific. So that's how big the Pacific is in terms of size. Antipodes, antipodes are, you know, points at the opposite ends of the diameter of the Earth. Okay, opposite ends of the, uh, not diameter, of the, of the sphere. So if you take, if you put a point here uh, at the bottom, at the other end of the Earth, so if, if you imagine a sphere, and if you put a point at, at this end, at the top end, and so that the other end, at the opposite end, there'll be another point, and these are called antipodes. And antipodes just offshore of Chile and Peru are just offshore of Vietnam and China. So the entire bit of the offshore of Chile and Peru to the entire, all around the earth, going to the uh, sort of the east coast of Chile and, uh, sorry, China and Vietnam, so the west of Chile and Peru, going all the way across to the east of China and Vietnam. All of that is water, and all of that is Pacific, actually. Yeah. So that's how big the Pacific is. All continents, in fact. Now, this is also very interesting, that all the continents can, can fit in the Pacific. So that, that is, again, an important thing, which, is, which has 50% of all the, the ocean in, in, in one. So... All five continents that we talk of, or you know, so if you if you take America as one, Asia as the other, Europe as the third one, uh, Africa and Australia, so all of that will fit in uh, in in the Pacific. So that's how uh, big the uh, Pacific is. Right. So this is the this is an interesting type of map of the world, which probably many of you might have, might not have, not have seen, because most of us, us seem to see the maps which are called either the Mercator projection. Mercator projection is the most standard view of most world maps that we see. Uh, the, the fault with the Mercator projection is that it is uh, it, it is it, the, the way it is the projection is done the Northern Hemisphere appears to be larger than the Southern Hemisphere. So 
the African continent or the South American continent or the Australian continent, they appear to be smaller than they actually are. Uh, and if you want to see this uh, visualized, you can look up, you can Google something called how large is Africa? Okay, just Google how large is Africa? And you will see, you'll be surprised to see that the continent of Africa can accommodate a huge number of num top countries, you know, like including the United States and India and China and many, many other countries, all of Europe, actually, for that matter. You know, So all of that can fit in Africa. So that's how big the African continent is. But when you see the Mercator projection, you don't see that. The other type of projection, which is somewhat more realistic, is called the Phillips projection. And the Phillips projection actually sh shows the size of the landmass as much or proportionate to what they are. But then both of them, both Mercator projection and the Phillips projection are earth centric, uh, sorry, land centric. They're, they're all land centric. They're not ocean centric. So this man, Athel Stan Spillhouse, uh, who is a South African American geophysicist, he came out with this different way of projecting the map of the world. And he thought, why not I look at the earth from an ocean centric point of view. Now this map was created in 1942, right? So that's almost 82 years ago. So this map was created in 82 years ago, but in about 2018, it, it got immense popularity. And that's when actually people you know, started sharing this map very widely, as we say in uh, modern terminology, say, we say it, this map went viral in 2018. And if you see this map, it starts off with the Antarctica as the center of the map and the Southern Ocean and all the three, you know, large oceans that we, we just talked about. And even all the smaller bodies of water, the Mediterranean Sea here, the Caspian Sea here, and so on. Okay, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, the, the Arctic Ocean on the other side, all of them, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Indian Ocean here, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and so on, the China Sea, all of that. So all these ocean or the water bodies, as it were, including going to smaller bits here, like the Baltic Sea and so on, the, 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 the North Sea here, the Irish Sea here, all of that. So all, all of that ocean body was projected in one square or a rectangular map. And this became the map, as it were, to show how important and how significant the ocean was. So I wanted to show this map, and it's called the Spillhouse Projection, named after this Athelstan um, uh, Spillhouse, uh, who was a South African-American uh, geophysicist and oceanographer. So again, how big is the ocean? So the ocean, as Sneha earlier mentioned, uh, that the ocean is 70% of Earth's surface, which we know, which we all know through, through our school things in geography. But it, it offers 99% of living space. So if you, if you take what is known as the biosphere, so where animals live, you know, living beings, living organisms live, then if you take that as the biosphere, then 99% of the biosphere is offered by the ocean. Think about it, because the ocean is very deep, and the ocean is very vast, and there is life everywhere in the ocean. And as a result of that, the biosphere is 99%. So that's why 99% of the living space on Earth is offered by the ocean. The sea to land ratio, is 60-40 in the Northern Hemisphere. So Northern Hemisphere, if we see, we, we think in terms of, okay, North America and Eurasia and, you know, India and China and all, all of that, you know, uh, much of half, half of Africa and some of Latin America and so on. So all of that is landmass. So we think there may be more land there than water. But no, even in the Northern Hemisphere, it's 60% water. Again, thanks to the presence of the Pacific, and the Atlantic to a great extent, 60 to 40. And in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, in fact, it's 80 to 20, okay? Because in the Southern Hemisphere, there's only one, one portion of Africa, there's one portion of South America, and there's Australia. And then the rest of it is all water. So 80% is 
of southern hemisphere is water only 20% of it is land average depth of the ocean average depth of the ocean is roughly 3733 meters uh, as we i'm sitting now in pune uh, and their policy center is based in pune so i thought i will take this reference of a peak in the state of maharashtra and this is called the kalsubai peak in the deccan uh, plateau and the highest the, the so the tallest uh, part of it which is the kalsubai peak is 1646 meters so that's less than half the average depth of the ocean and if you take the tallest mountain which is the mount everest it is still roughly about a good couple of thousand meters shallower than the depth deepest point on earth which is 11022 meters which is the mariana trench now the mid oceanic ridge which is the mountain system as it were in the middle of the ocean that is 64000 kilometers long so it is longer than all the mountain ranges on the land combined and it is 2000 kilometers wide so that's how the sea mounts are how 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 uh, widely spread and how vast the sea mounts are so the mid oceanic ridge is 64000 kilometers long four times lo longer than all the mountain ranges on the land combined and over 2000 kilometers wide 2000 kilometers wide is almost going from one end of you know from dwarka to you know to somewhere in manipur or somewhere some something like that and a bit more per perhaps so 2000 kilometers wide 96.5% of all the water on the earth is in the ocean ice on land is 2% which is sadly melting pretty quickly which is which is a big issue which we'll probably mention in one or two places but of course this course is about ocean literacy so we are not doing so much about climate change as, than as we should but because obviously the times are limited it's only 20 hour program but ice on land is 2% ground water ground water means the water that you get when you drill the ground with a bore well or with a well and that's 1% rivers and lakes that is open water that's 0.2% and water in the atmosphere which is either going up as steam from the all the water bodies or which is waiting to come down as rain is just about 0.1% so it's a very you know fragile amount of water that is available to mankind to drink to use for agriculture to use for industrial purposes and so on and so forth just to give you a quick fact 70% of all the water of course this percentage would vary this is a global percentage this is worldwide percentage 70% of all water is used for agriculture 70% of all water is used for agriculture 20% is used for industrial purposes and 10% is used for municipal purposes that is for human beings to drink cook etc etc i was at a museum in 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 the netherlands not too long ago it was called the uh, the the water museum and the water museum uh, in one place had a bath you know the the baths that you see uh, in some houses or maybe in the movies and stuff like that the bath the bath which is which is quite a substantial you know tub of water where you you take a bath and this it was full of water and on top of that of course they laid a sheet of polythene and put a teaspoon you know the one which with, with which you put sugar in your tea and stuff like that so a small teaspoon was put and what it said the caption said that the entire body of water is signified by the body of water in this bath tub and the water available to drink is only the one in the teaspoon and which is where now the the water crisis that we talk about and we hear about and particularly in maharashtra uh, in in the in the marathwada region we hear about it this year particularly in in from bangalore which is our you know 
uh, which is the cap, which is our Silicon Valley, as it were, it's the capital of our IT industry, and it is suffering from a huge amount of water shortages. And um, we mentioned, I think Sneha mentioned earlier that we commenced this program on the 22nd of March, which is the World Water Day uh, in 1922, sorry, in 2022. So in 2022 on World Water Day, which was 22nd March, we commenced the program. And this time too, uh, on 22nd March, uh, will fall uh, during the, our course. And uh, uh, we, we will have a lecture, I think that day, uh, it's a Friday, uh, the lecture will be by uh, Captain Agnihotri. Uh, and that that is, that day I think, uh, we sh we should be we might be talking a little more about World Water Day and water related uh, issues. Again, how significant is the ocean? Um, the ocean, among others, interalia meaning among others, absorbs twenty five percent of all the anthropogenic CO two. So anthropogenic CO two means CO two that is produced by human activities not just by human beings, but whatever we do in terms of the trains, planes, aeroplanes, trucks, and so on, that we drive the agriculture that we do, the animals that we have in huge quantities. Uh, I must mention this, although because we, we probably won't get a chance to mention it all the time, it's come to my mind now. So let me mention to you, and it's something very thought provoking at the same time, it's extremely worrying that <clears throat> that 64, uh, sorry, 60% 60 of all the animals, 60% of all the mammals, sorry, 60% of all the mammals on the earth today are farm animals, animals that we are grown for meat and milk. So they are all our cows and, you know, buffaloes and pigs and etc. etc. So 60%, mind you, 60% of all mammals on the earth are animals that we have grown for our food and our milk, milk and meat, okay? 36% are us human beings. 36% of all mammals are us human beings, 8 billion of us and counting. Only 4% are left in the wild. So all the tigers and elephants and giraffes and you know, you name it, lions and all that, they are all only 4%, only 4% of mammals are left on the earth in the wild, okay? So imagine how bad the situation is. But anyway, so all the carbon dioxide that we produce as human beings through our various activities, 25% of that is absorbed by the ocean. It also generates 50 to 80% of oxygen in the atmosphere. <clears throat> we'll talk about it a little bit later, how it does it. So imagine at least one in every two breaths that we take, or perhaps three in every four breaths that we take, the oxygen for our breathing, for our lungs to take in and you know create our red blood cells and hemoglobin and all that kind of things that we know about in, in medicine or in physiological sciences, that is coming from the ocean. It is 70% of the Earth's surface, we've seen that, receives 80% of land-based pollution. There's an organization called uh, uh, Group of Experts on the Scientific Aspects of Marine Pollution, GESAM. And this organization produces reports year after, the, year after year on the state of the pollution of the earth. And according to them, 80% of all pollution in the ocean is from land-based sources. It is coming from agriculture, from industry, and from municipal waste, all of which is ending up in the ocean. Of course, the, the worst of all of that pollutant is plastics because they don't degenerate. They, plastics, the plastic do not disintegrate or they do not biodegrade, okay? So that's the worst of the pollutant. So all of that, is, gener is coming from the earth, ending up in the ocean. Whatever we do, they, uh, there, was a, there was a conference some time ago that I helped organize and attend in, 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 in Australia, and it was called From the Hilltops to the Ocean, H2O, as it was called. No, hill, hilltops, H, to the oceans, O. H2O and water, of course, H2O being water. 
So this conference was called Hilltops of the Ocean because the water goes from the hilltops because that's where the water originates. Most water originates, most rivers originate at some height. And then from there, they flow and they go into the ocean. And along the way, we put in, predominantly we put in a whole lot of effluent, a whole lot of waste, a whole lot of pollutants into this these rivers, which all eventually ends up in the marine environment absorbs 90% excess heat from anthropogenic emissions. Again, we also produce a lot of heat as a result of our agriculture, as a result of our animal farming, as a result of us being alive ourselves, and as a result of industrial activities and all our, you know, like I said, our all our modes of transport, you know, uh, from two-wheelers to three-wheelers to four-wheelers to, to juggernaut trucks and to trains and planes and all that. So all of that are generating heat. And all of that heat is being absorbed, is being going into the atmosphere. But the ocean, again, absorbs a lot of that heat because it's got a huge capacity to absorb heat. But that is not enough now. We've found that the capacity of the ocean to absorb heat, to absorb carbon dioxide, to absorb pollution is now being tested because we are putting far too much of it and the oceans simply cannot cope with it. As a result of it, the ocean temperature is going up. The ocean acidity is going up because too much carbon dioxide. And it basically is making the ocean more acidic and it's making the ocean warmer. And as it does that, we see the phenomena around us in terms of water shortages, in terms of climate change, in terms of changes of seasons. When I was a little boy, when I studied at school, uh, and in Maharashtra, particularly in the school books, in geography books, we used to be taught that rains come to Maharashtra or to India or to, to sorry, to Mumbai on the 7th of June. That was the day. You know, 7th of June was the day of rain in Mumbai. And it did rain on the 7th of June. And nowadays, sometimes it doesn't rain on the 7th of July. It doesn't even rain on 7th of August, you know. And then it carries on raining at times when it should not rain. So there's a lot of change, shift of climate, shift of, shift of seasons and so on. So all of that is happening because of that. Carries 95%. I've, I've given these by increasing percentage. So that's why I'm repeating one or two of these things but carries 95% of world trade by weight. So this is amazing. So most of us who live don't live uh, or, or don't know about this will be surprised. Even, even my colleagues who are well-educated and well-knowledgeable about transport and about stuff like that, they wouldn't believe when I tell them that 90% or 95% of world's trade by, by gross registered tonnage happens by sea because most of the raw material and most of the finished products are carried worldwide by ships, right? And 95% of world trade happens to the, it's, it's only, then it is, when, the, when it's a secondary carrying, for example, from the ports going into the various cities, that probably goes by trains or juggernaut trucks and stuff like that, or planes from cities to cities, depending on how expensive the commodity is. But then I put slavery at the, in, the, in, in, in there. And 95% of all the world trade, if it is carried by, by the sea, and there is known, it is known that there are still 50 million people in bonded labor or in maritime slavery. That means slavery as is practiced in the maritime world, whether it's in fishing, whether it is in the transport sector, whether it's in the ports, harbors, whatever. So if there are 50 million people and they have the, and it's 95% of all the stuff, and I call it stuff because it can be raw material, it can be finished product, both. So all the stuff is carried by, on ships. Everything that you and I touch from the toothpaste in the morning and in the, at, at night to the clothes we wear, you know, to, to the shoes we wear, to the shampoo that we put on our heads or whatever we do, the soap or whatever, the raw material for it or the finished product for it has gone through the sea and 
it has been touched by slaves so slaves we are we are you know slaves are touching our lives on a day to day basis and that's again something really to worry about think about and do something about contains 97% of all the water on the planet 97% of all the water <coughs> on the planet is contained in the sea facilitates 98% of all digital communication you know we 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 often say that you know there is a cloud uh, in which all my data is stored and you know all my virtual you know uh, digital storage is there in the cloud that cloud is not there but it's there it's down in the sea so facilitates and in fact this this conversation that we are having uh, not just within the, within india but internationally sometimes we have a lot of webinars nowadays especially after covid uh, and uh, all of that is happening because thanks to the submarine cables that are laid down into the sea for communication and again as i've said before it offers 99% of earth's biosphere living space <clears throat> So here's a just an illustration of the submarine cables that are carrying our communication, our digital communication, through throughout the world, and see how dense some of these communication cable networks are, and especially through some very, uh, very crucial and very critical junc junctions, such as uh, you know, for example, the the Suez Suez here, you know. And if there's an accident there uh, in Alexandria, not too long ago, there was an accident. I think earlier this year, there was an accident when uh, four major cables were disrupted. Uh, not not in the Suez, sorry, it was in the in the Red Sea during the, the this this fight that is currently going on between Israel and Hamas, and uh, Houthis bombed a vessel which sank. Houthis being from Yemen, and they are trying to play mischief in that area by bombing uh, vessels uh, in that in that region and one of the vessels sank and when the vessel sank the anchor of that vessel you know dragged along the seafloor and damaged four of the uh, underwater sea cables undersea cables which then disrupted the communication and that that happens uh, very often uh, and that can be quite uh, devastating for for global communication. So the ocean is big, the ocean is significant, but sadly we know very little about the ocean. So we know little less about the ocean than we know we, we know less about the ocean's bottom than the moon's backside. That's what Roger Reville sort of said in a tongue-in-cheek way. Because there are, I think, about a dozen people that have walked on the surface of the moon so far. So we know little, we know less about the ocean's bottom than the moon's backside, because obviously all the landings have been on the other side of the moon, on the dark side of the moon. If you sort of Pink Floyd, the famous you know, rock group had this uh, album called The Dark Side of the Moon, the other side of the moon. Um, so Roger Revelle was this famous American oceanographer who established the uh, who who worked in the uh, uh, Scripps Oceanographic Institution uh, in you know uh, which is currently um, under the United, uh, under the University of California San Diego, and he said that um, only about the only about five percent of the ocean floor has been mapped, in the sense that in the sense uh, how the land is mapped. If you compare with that, only 5% of the ocean floor has been mapped. Land is mapped to the last square inch, I, I would suppose. Yeah. Whereas, of course, there are some parts of land that, that may, may, not be, have, may not have been mapped to the last square inch, but still is significantly mapped. So if you compare that, only 5% of the ocean floor has been mapped to that level. And only, and this is extremely important too, only seven and a half, some people say this percentage has now gone up a little bit, maybe eight, nine percent or something like that, but only about seven and a half percent of the ocean is protected. So protected area as a protected area. Like we have, uh, you know, 
national parks and stuff like that, which are protected areas. So like that, we only have seven and a half percent of the ocean, which is protected area. We need to make it much more. And one of the things that is happening in that direction and is happening pretty quickly as a result of uh, last year's uh, high seas treaty, which we'll talk about briefly, uh, uh, that there is a United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development. United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And the motto of that or the strap line of that is the science we need for the ocean we want. And the proposal, according to this oceans, uh, uh, decade for ocean science for sustainable development, is that we should have 30% of the ocean protected as we have national parks, etc. So we should have marine parks or marine reserves and so on. And there should be 30% of the ocean protected by the year 2030. So six years from now, we should have 30% of the ocean protected by, by 2030. And this, is, uh, this can be achieved uh, because we have this new treaty that has come, come in and that is called the High Seas Treaty. And the High Seas Treaty is looking after areas beyond national jurisdiction. Yeah, ABNJ, as it is called, areas beyond national jurisdiction and biodiversity beyond nas national jurisdiction. So areas beyond national jurisdiction, we'll talk about what they are. So areas beyond national jurisdiction are the ones that we want to protect. And we want to protect the biodiversity in that area of area beyond national jurisdiction. So that is called BBNJ. So sometimes the treaty is called the BBNJ treaty, or sometimes it's called the High Seas Treaty. I've also got this other idea, which I thought I will mention alongside three, 30 by 30. There is another concept on land, which is also very important in terms, when we talk in terms of protected areas, et cetera, how our urban area should be, how Pune should be, or how Mumbai should be, or how any city in India or anywhere in the world should be. And they have this, broad rule of thumb idea, how far it is uh, true in many parts of the world or not yet to be seen. But ideally, 330, 300 is the concept that people are trying to evolve when, when planning or when developing new urban areas and also re, re, reorganizing old urban areas. So three being, whichever building or whichever house or whichever apartment that you live in, office building or whatever, you open the window, you should be able to see three trees, three fully grown trees, grown trees. <coughs> then you should live in an area which has got 30% canopy cover. Okay. So the canopy cover in the area that you live should be 30, 30%. And 300 is there should be a public park or a garden where you can go with your, your, your family, your children, kick a ball, you know, have a picnic or whatever, should be within 300 meters of where you live. So 330, 300. Three trees, 30% per canopy cover, and a park, a public park, 300 meters from you. So that's uh, that would be really good for any urban area. And obviously, we know little about the ocean, so we have to do something about it, to know more about it. And from that, how are we doing with, with time, uh, Sneha? Hello? Uh, so we still have an hour to go. Another hour, OK, good. Yeah, so, uh, the hour including with the question and answer. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so, so how little do we know about the ocean? So we, we, we talked about that. So what has been done to know more about the ocean? And I have got this whole lot of acronyms here, which are the activities that have been conducted to know more about the ocean, to know more about the earth, our earth. So the first one of those was the International Geophysical Year. International Geophysical Year. This was in the year 1959, if I'm not mistaken. Then, 
International Indian Ocean Expedition. So that was later. Then there is the International Deep Ocean Exploration. There is Deep Sea Drilling Program, DSDP, after that. There is Ocean Drilling Program. There is International Geosphere Biosphere Program. Then Fine Resolution Atmospheric Model. World's Ocean Circulation Experiment. World Climate Research Program. Global Atmospheric Research Program. Biogeochemical Ocean Flux Studies. And this is a joint uh, sort of uh, global ocean flux study. Auto sub being a device which is used to so autonomous vehicle to study the ocean. Another type of autonomous vehicle here called Gloria, which is geological long range inclined as dick. And that's again another device that is stored along to study more about the ocean bottom, uh, the seafloor. Tropical ocean and global atmosphere, how tropical oceans are very, how tropical ocean is more important in terms of governing the atmosphere, global atmosphere. Global, global ocean observation system, global terrestrial observation system, global climate observation system, international geological observation system, Scientific Commission on Ocean Research, Engineering Commission on Ocean Research, uh, Intergovernmental, inter, inter actually, sorry, inter, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the UNESCO, Man and Biosphere Program, Long and Extended Project on Ocean Research, Deep Ocean Tracer Experiment. This is the British Ridge Experiment land ocean interaction studies, land ocean interaction and coastal zone, and of course, the most recent, the United Nations decade on ocean science for sustainable development. So a lot of efforts have been done since the 1950s and carrying on even today. In fact, the United Nations uh, decade of ocean science for sustainable development started in 2021 and will continue until 2030 with the intention that we will hopefully have learned more about the ocean floor, number one, and we would have 30% of the ocean under protected, as, as protected area. So, what are the various zones or the layers of the earth? And this graphic shows you what they are. So you have the sunlight zone at the top, which is called the epipelagic zone. Then we have the mesopelagic zone, which is the twilight zone. So you can see by about 200 meters, the ocean starts getting dark. In fact, people that dive into the ocean will tell you and most of the people who do it scuba diving do do you know tens of feet, not much more than that. But even with the more sophisticated equipment, they may not be able to do much more than a few 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 tens of meters. And then people who dive more substantively than that will tell you that by the time you go to about two hundred meters depth, the ocean starts getting darker and darker. So then, the midnight zone, that means it's almost uh, almost dark there, which is bath bathypelagic zone. Bath, bath, B -A -T -H, bath is depth. So isobath, for example, just like we have isotherm for lines joining equal temperatures, isobath is lines joining equal depths. So this word bath comes from there, bathypelagic zone, which is called the midnight zone. And then we have abyssopelagic zone, which is at the abyssal plains, what are called as called the abyssal plains, they are important from an interesting point of view because the mineral uh, that people are now looking for, in fact, today 
it was in the news. Uh, uh, I just heard it on, on the BBC news today uh, that uh, ocean mining uh, is heating up. You know, the claims for ocean mining are heating up. And that's going to be happening in this abyssal plains area, which is around 4,000 to 6,000 meters deep. And then we have what is known as the Hadal zone or the trenches or what are known as the deep sea trenches. And at some point there, you see shown the height of the uh, height of Mount Everest, so which is somewhere there. And the deep sea trenches are much further down beyond that. So So again, uh, the layers of the sea or the layers of the ocean. So we have the, again, going back to the same terminology with a little bit of description. So epipelagic or sunlight zone or the photic zone, photo being light. So photic zone is the zone of light up to 200 meters. Scuba diving will take you at most 40 meters, really 20 meters, like I said, you know, no more than that. Uh, almost all fisheries resources of the world, the commercial fishery resources of the world, they live in that particular zone. Meso mesopelagic zone or twilight zone is up to 1,000 meters. Many living creatures here make daily vertical migration for food or they become food themselves. So it's it's both ways. You know, the, the, the predator becomes the prey or you know, the prey becomes the predator, whichever way, you know. So... So, uh, sorry, the, the predator becomes the prey at some time. So many creatures living here make this daily vertical migration uh, to find food or become food themselves. Then bathypelagic zone, which is the midnight zone, total number of species here is rather limited. Uh, and there are some fish here, such as the angler fish, they will emit light. They, they will emit their own light to lure their prey. So uh, just, just as we are curious about things, you know, uh, like they say, the curious cat kind of things. So fish are also curious. So they think, oh, where's this light coming from? So they go there and they immediately become prey to this angler fish. Uh, abyss of pelagic zone or the abyss, life becomes rather sparse in the water, but somewhat more abundant on the seafloor. So in the water, it's somewhat less abundant, but somewhat more abundant on the seafloor. And then hadal zone uh, or trenches, some life exists despite the ex impossible depths and pressures. You can imagine the amount of water pressure that is there on these organisms. Some of these organisms, when they are brought up through some of these, uh, you know, uh, trawls and searches, etc., when they're brought up, they just explode because they, the pressure goes. So, you know, they're, they're, that, that they're, they're used to un being under that pressure and that can never be sustained uh, uh, in, the, in the normal levels. Um, I come to another aspect now to talk about uh, plate tectonics, this theory of plate tectonics, which uh, gathered momentum, as it were, or, or was established uh, in the year 1960. Uh, before that, uh, there was a famous German geologist by the name of Alfred Wegener, uh, who had a theory which went from about early 20th century until about 1960, and that was called the uh, theory of continental drift. So the idea was the continents, continents moved as if they were floating on the water. But uh, that was not the case. They were not floating on the water or magma. Uh, they were uh, moving according to this theory of plate tectonics. So they, they, this unified theory of plate tectonics came in, uh, in in 1960. We all know that we were there was one cluster of all the continents together uh, that was called Pangaea. Uh, and Gondwana land and all that, and then they broke up and then they went to their own places, which they are now, and they're still moving, okay? And that movement is what the plate tectonics describes or explains. So uh, this is a map of the plate tectonics of the world. Uh, there are seven uh, major plates. So, uh, so uh, starting from the left, you have number one, Eurasian, number two, Indo-Australian plate, sometimes split into two, the Indian plate and the Australian plate. Um, so that's two. Pacific plate is number three. Uh, number four is the North American plate. Number five is the South American plate. Uh, and then there is a Eurasian plate and there's the African plate. So there are seven 
uh, or eight, depending on how you count them. If you count Indo-Australian as two, then it becomes eight. Otherwise, there are seven plates. And there are 12 smaller plates, such as the Cocos plate or the uh, Philippines plate and so on. You know, so there are there are these smaller plates, the NASA, uh, NASCA plate and, and so on. So there are these smaller plates, uh, Huan Di Puka, Puka plate here. So there are 12 smaller plates uh, together. This is uh, this gives you the overall map uh, of the plate tectonics. Here you'll see uh, there are three predominant colors. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the green one uh, is the convergent plate boundaries. Somehow my, my, this strap is not able to come off. I don't know how to get rid of it, this black thing. Does anybody know, Sneha? How do you get rid of this black thing here at the bottom? Um, so is it in the image? So if you no, can... It's not in the image. It's, it's, um, it's, um, it's, you know, it says mute, stop video, participants, chat, summary, AI companion, etc. You know, the, the Zoom bar. Sir, I, uh, sir uh, I don't think you can remove that, sir. It's not possible to remove it. Ah, That's okay. Fine. Okay, so it just stays there permanently, is it? Yes. I thought I thought there was a way of getting rid of it because I I could see I could see the bottom of some of my my slides, but now I can't see them. Uh, hide video panel. No, what is it? What does it do? I don't know. No. Sorry. Show video panel. Ah, here it is. Hide floating. No. Share. No. Anyway, but. But there's convergent plate boundaries, which are de depicted in green. Uh, the divergent plate boundaries are depicted in, 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 in blue. And the transform boundaries are depicted in the red color. So that's what I wanted to show you because that was the legend of this picture. But anyway, they will, it shows it on this next, next picture. So there are three types of boundaries between plates. So the... Uh, the, I mean, the first one I, I would talk about is what, what I would say is the uh, divergent plate boundaries. So that's where uh, plates are moving away from each other and physically actually new land is being created as it was. Although we're talking about, you know, a few millimeters or a few centimeters in a year or something like that. Nothing, nothing, nothing spectacular like, you know, you can't watch it happening. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's slower than watching paint dry as it were. So, so. There is what is called as a divergent plate boundary, which is the second picture here, this one. Then there is the convergent plate boundary where plates hit, come and hit together, hit, hit one another. So what then happens, um, you, 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 we, don't go, we don't want to go too much into the detail of this, but uh, normally we have something called the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust is the, 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 the stuff that we... We survive on our, all our minerals and all our, uh, you know, mining and everything, uh, the water, the, the underground water and everything, all of that is within the Earth's crust. And the continental crust is generally thicker and the oceanic crust is somewhat thinner. So when the oceanic crust and continental cr crust hit each other, then the thicker crust remains there, the thinner crust goes down like that. So it goes down and this one raises up and this creates <coughs> mountains. It builds mountains. So it's the convergent plate boundaries uh, are, are, are do what is known as an orogenic activity, mountain building activity. And orogenic activity is through which what all the mountains are built. So uh, one, of the, one of the newest mountain uh, 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 mountains in the world are the Himalayas, which is why they are the tallest and also the fastest growing uh, in, in geological terms. So they ha have happened because of the Indian plate hitting the Eurasian plate and then subducting the Indian plate, subducting and raising the Eurasian plate and creating the mountain. So that's the second picture. That's the what we call as the uh, convergent a boundary and then the the picture to the left is called the transform boundary where plates kind of slide against each other so they they don't they don't move away from each other nor do they collide against each other but they just slide against each other 
<coughs> so predominantly in the convergent plate boundaries, earthquakes take place more, more earthquakes. In fact, 80% of all earthquakes take place in the convergent plate boundaries. So Himalayan border, for example, we hear of earthquakes in the northern part of our country, in Nepal, and so on. So they are, they are the result of what we call as the convergent plate boundary there. The, I'm not saying that earthquakes don't happen, but majority of what happens there is earthquakes. In the divergent plate boundaries, where plate boundaries are going away from each other, obviously there what's happening is when the plates are moving away from each other, the ocean crust, which is already thinner than the rest of the crust, is getting even thinner at that point because they're moving away. So then the volcanic eruption takes place there. So most of the divergent plate boundaries is where the volcanic eruption is predominant. I'm not again saying that earthquakes don't take place there, but predominant activity there is, uh, is what we call as volcanic eruption. And in the transform boundary, where the plates kind of slide against each other, uh, there most of the shallow earthquakes take place, which are more dangerous, actually, to come to think about it, which is why all the earthquakes that we hear about, which happen uh, and happen to a dev devastating consequence, they happen at the transform boundary places. And they are the ones who cause the transform boundaries are the ones that cause shallow earthquakes, shallow level earthquakes. And they are, of course, they'll be the ones that would cause the most devastation uh, in, a, in, a, in an area. Um, and then we have the famous, uh, the ring of fire, uh, the Pacific ring of fire, as it is called. It is 40,000 kilometers long. So if you take this entire pink or whatever you like to call it, a pink colored patch going all the way along like that. If you see it like this, okay. So all of that is the Pacific Ring of Fire. Uh, and uh, this is all what you call as mostly uh, convergent plate boundaries in most places. Uh, the, the, and uh, 40,000 kilometers long and up to 500 kilometers wide. So in places, it's even more. For example, in this region here in the South China Sea, it's the widest, but on the average, it's about 500 kilometers wide. And it's a huge area. And two thirds of all the active volcanoes that happen around the world uh, or are happening around the world, including the one that just happened of, uh, of course, this is Pacific, but the one that I'm talking about is in Iceland. Uh, so any of these uh, volcanoes happen because of these so-called uh, convergent, uh, so, uh, sorry, divergent plate boundaries. And this is where uh, the ring of fire is. Okay. And then finally, I think we are coming to the end of the talk. Um, just to explain to you a little bit about the coastal uh, and marine environment. So shoreline is what we people, most of the people who go to the sea uh, are the people who will see the shoreline. Um, and the shoreline is just above the high tide line. If you don't go into the water and if you remain where the, where the land is still there, that would call that you would call a shoreline. And shoreline is just above the high tide line. Uh, diverse breeding sites for shorebirds, seabirds, and other animals uh, uh, are there. And so this is basically, I, I'm saying, I'm talking in terms of coastal marine environment as well as ecology, you know, the, the life there. Intertidal is the zone between the high and the low water mark. So I, I mentioned to you right at the beginning of the talk, and I was talking about the tides. So the tides, the high tide and the low tide happen twice a day. And the spring tide, which is the highest of the high tide, and the neap tide, which is the lowest of the low tide, they happen uh, every so often. So this, this, this difference between the highest tide and the lowest tide is the intertidal zone. That's where the tides are coming in and tides are going out. So that is where there is a, there is a marked change of salinity uh, and of water itself. So there are there are there'll be a point of time in day during the day when there might be no water and a point in 
time during the day when it may be completely submerged underwater. And again, uh, because if, if the water is not going all the way to the, to the point and if there are some lagoons or if there are some uh, rock pools, as they call it, then the water goes away. Uh, and if it rains at that time, then the salinity will reduce uh, and there'll be variation of salinity. So you have to have animals that can cope with change of salinity and change of sudden change of temperature, daily change of salinity and daily change of temperatures. So then there are estuaries, salt marshes and wetlands. Again, these are characterized by variable salinity and variable temperature differences on a day-to-day -day basis, diurnal changes as they are called. And then you have mangroves in the tropical and the subtropical regions, uh, with the trees that tolerate brackish and salt water. So mangroves are extremely important. Uh, mangrove forests, as they're called, or mangles, sometimes known as mangles. So mangles or mangrove forests uh, uh, are typical to tropical and subtropical regions. So in fact, they are found in the coasts of almost all parts of the world. And these are trees that tolerate brackish water and salt water, which normal trees on land don't. They need fresh water. Then there are kelp forests. So in the temperature range, range so this is in the uh, subtropical region, where temperature in regions is below 20 degrees. And that's where large brown algae up to 50 meters long. And these are called kelp forests. So these are in the northern part and the southern parts of the, of the world. And uh, so temperature generally below 20 degrees. And the, the, they are 50 meters long, huge uh, uh, leaves, as it were, you know, kelp forests. And then seagrass meadows are to be found in clear sheltered water up to 50 meters deep, up to 50 meters deep. And then, of course, coral reefs, which are a diverse habitat in shallow tropical waters. Now, here the water has got to be above 18 degrees centigrade for the corals to survive, uh, average temperature. Again, but like I said, if it gets too hot, then they die. And if the salinity goes too much, sorry, if the, if the, if the, if the acidity goes up too much, then again, they die. Uh, so both ways, there, there's a problem. So there's average temperature around 18 degrees and above, and that's where we have coral reefs. And if you read a little bit about this, you will see that uh, these three together, uh, so if you combine the kelp forest and the sing, uh, seagrass meadows as one, uh, and call them, say, seagrass meadows or kelp forest or whatever, and then if you have mangroves as the second and the coral reefs as the third, these three are known as our insurance against climate change. So if we can, if we can reforest our mangroves, and uh, currently Bangladesh is doing some spectacular work in, uh, in planting their mangroves and growing mangroves, and we have to take a lead from them. And perhaps if you have more and more mangroves, if you have more and more seagrass meadows and kelp forests, and if we can revive our dying coral reef, it has been shown that coral reef can be revived. Coral reef, by the way, is animal, mineral, and vegetable at the same time. You know, there's no other, there is no other thing, you know, if you like to say, I don't know what to call it, but no other living thing in the world which is animal, mineral, and vegetable at the same time. Okay, uh, most living things are not mineral. Well, we, we are no, sorry, I, I made a mistake there. All of us are mineral, but all three of them together mineral, vegetable, and uh, animal, mineral, vegetable all three. And coral reef is an excellent example of that. So, mangroves, seagrass meadows, and coral reefs together, the three of them form the best insurance against climate change. So, the more we protect, the more we preserve. The more we develop, the more we refurbish, the more we grow these, climate change will be, uh, I mean, the, the effects of climate change will reduce. And of course, I should mention before I move on to the next slide that trees are, are our 
on land okay the, the ones that you know take fresh water and you know eat up carbon dioxide and give us oxygen and any vegetation any vegetation and trees are our number one insurance against climate change plant trees indiscriminately plant and trees can be planted anywhere it has been shown you know trees plant can be planted anywhere and if you plant trees water will come see people always say you need water for the trees yes you need water for the trees but if you get the water for the trees and plant the trees water will come because trees will arrest water vegetation will arrest water it will take the water into the ground and it will rain water harvesting that we talk about as a artificial method of doing things is a natural system so the current slogan worldwide is trillion new trees and my own sub slogan for that is any tree is better than no tree but of course it is good to plant indigenous trees not trees that are from somewhere else it is always good to plant the tree that is local because otherwise you have all sorts of ecological problems environmental and ecological problems but plant trees indiscriminately trillion new trees and any tree is better than no tree so again plant a tree any tree is better than no tree and the best tree is the one that you plant apparently there's a friend of mine not apparently there's a friend of mine his philosophy is that each one of us to become carbon neutral on the average okay needs to plant 14 trees and see them grown up so he's got a foundation called 14 trees foundation it's in it's near pune and if he could do it on a completely barren patch of land completely barren patch of mountain side hill side within a matter of 10 years he has planted 1.2 million trees and all of them are surviving and thriving and he's planting more anybody can do it so life in the ocean there are planktons nectons and benthos so those are the main microorganisms in the ocean planktons float nectons swim and benthos live on the sea floor so that's that's a distinction so the one is floating on the top the other ones are moving about and the benthos as i said benth beth bath bethic benthic benthic that's to do with the deep so they live on the sea floor so the planktons phytoplankton and zooplankton are the very basis of the marine food web and the food for humans also because obviously it's a food chain it's a food web you know jivo jivasya jivanam you know life depends on life another life to to survive 50 to 85% of all oxygen on the earth comes from the ocean thanks to photosynthesis by plankton so it's the photosynthesis that is carried out by planktons which are on the surface and floating those are the ones that are absorbing the carbon dioxide and giving out oxygen for us three main ecosystems are the coastal marine system that we talked about you know the mangroves and the sea grass and the kelp forests and the corals open sea and deep sea ecosystems in the marine environment marine biodiversity of course there is another one that we only found out not too long ago and that is marine biodiversity thrives not just with photosynthesis because that's what we thought we thought until 1975 i've said it in the next next bullet point until 1975 we thought photosynthesis was the only mechanism that was happening in the ocean but now we know that marine biodiversity thrives not just with photosynthesis but when you go into the deep ocean into the trenches into the deep sea trenches into the volcanic zones etc 
etc., into the zones of these great turmoils of earthquakes and volcanic activity, etc. There, something else is functioning, and that is chemosynthesis. It's a completely different phenomenon. Hydrogen sulfides becoming the life becomes the life giver, which is a poison otherwise. So white smoker chimneys and black smoker chimneys were only discovered in 1975. This is when I was still an undergraduate student. So it's my, in my living memory that these things were discovered and we heard about it for the first time later, of course, not immediately after 1975, but a little bit later. But we were aware of it in, in our undergraduate days that such discoveries are happening. And there's something called chemosynthesis that is taking place in the deeper ocean. And this leads, this chemosynthesis leads to marine genetic, genetic resources because resources that we hitherto haven't heard of or haven't explored because we don't know, like I said, we don't know much about the ocean. So a lot of this is not being mapped properly and we don't know much about it. Which is why, in fact, the entire BBNJ treaty, the ocean mining, and the thing that I talked about today's news saying ocean mining is heating up and people are up in arms about the idea that ocean mining will take place in the near future and the world and the ocean floors will be trawled for the manganese nodules. That is something that is an anathema to these marine genetic resources because they are the future of our medicine, our food, our uh, pharmaceuticals, and so on and so forth. So I think it's very important that we be extremely vigilant and extremely um, circumspect in what we do and not do something in haste uh, and regret later. So I think uh, I am at the end of today's session because it shows the next session by me. So I will stop here now. Sneha, and um, if I may, if people have uh, any questions or anything like that, I'd be delighted to answer. Any, any, uh, what you call, uh, any comments, criticism, any contribution, etc., also would be much appreciated. So not just questions, um, but uh, also anything that you want to contribute, because you're also, of course, all learned people, and you know. Uh, perhaps a lot more about uh, more than I do about many things that I talked about. So, so please feel free to ask, uh, contribute, and uh, generally give your comments, whichever way you feel. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil, sir, uh, for this presentation. Uh, the floor is open for discussion of participants. If you have any questions, queries, uh, or you want to comment on this uh, presentation and this course as well, uh, you can raise your hand virtually. Please, I'll address you all in. And you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. 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 It's Chanchal, please. Hello. Yeah, I'm Chanchal Singer. I'm Nikobar Alliance. Uh, my question is uh, this present explain acidification. What are the major acids uh, due to the pollution? Uh, basically, I am from the coastal part of India. And uh, my question is what are the different type of acids traits for the corals and marine life? See, on a on a global scale, you know, when we talk in terms of pollutions and when we talk of biodegradable pollutants, which many of them are, except I mentioned to you plastics and some petrochemicals, you know, that, that we produce human beings, you know, because otherwise, if you see pollutants, every pollutant that we make or the atmosphere or the, or the, or the environment generates uh, naturally or artificially is also produced by the marine environment naturally. So it is nothing new for them. For example, oil. So when oil waste goes or if there is an oil spill, 
into the ocean. There is oil seeping into the ocean from the ocean floor all the time. And the quantity of the oil that is spilling, that is seeping into the ocean from the ocean floor is far more than the amount that goes in because of a shipwreck or a, because of a shipping accident. The reason it is problematic is because it is concentrated. It is the concentration of it. It is not the amount of it, but it is the concentration of it at a given place. If it is in a diffused way, the ocean can deal with it to, to greatly. But the problem of acidification is because of the global carbon dioxide increase. increase. Because that is, although carbolic acid, you know, H, HCNO3, as it is called, sorry, H, um, H2CO3, as it is called, okay, car carbolic acid, it is not a strong acid, but the amount of it that we are producing, I'll give you an example. In the year 1800, when these measurements started, in the year 1800, about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the parts per million of carbon dioxide was 283. Okay? I'm talking about 1800. Remember the figures. Year 1800, the figure was 283. 283 parts per million. I was born in 1955. So that is 155 years later. Okay? 155 years later. And that time, the CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere increased from 283 to 313. So sometimes when people ask me, some of the climate people ask me, when were you born? I say 313. Okay? Not 1955. I say 313. Okay? So 313 was an increase of 30 from 283 to 313 in a 155 years, mind you. Okay? Today, I am 68 years old. And the car... CO2 PPT parts per, not PPT, PPM parts per million is 424, 423, let's say for, for, sake, for the sake of argument. So that means it has gone up by how much? It has gone up by 110, okay, 110 in a matter of 68 years as against only 30 in a, mat in a matter of 155 years. So that is how the acidification is happening. So if you want to really reduce the acidification, it is a CO2 percentage, it's a CO2 parts per million that have to go down, which is why we are anchoring after people for zero carbon, you know, zero carbon growth, net, uh, net zero, and, and all sorts of things. And the reason why we are saying that we should cut down on fossil fuels and go for renewables, Go for solar, okay. Go for hydrogen. Go for nuclear. You know, it might come strange coming from an environment like environmentalist like me, but I should tell you that nuclear is our golden bridge between our fossil past and our renewable future. So this is our renewable. This is our fossil past. This is our renewable future. Nuclear is our golden bridge. Why? Because nuclear is a known safe technology, irrespective of the big stories that we hear of Chernobyl or Fukushima or Three Mile Island, nuclear is the safest means of producing energy today. Because we have seen that thermal power, producing thermal power by burning coal is much, much, much more disastrous because millions of people are dying as we speak. In Delhi today, young children, as young as 20, when their lungs are examined, their lungs, they have not even started smoking. They're 20-year-old children. When their lungs are examined, their lungs are as bad as a person smoking 20 cigarettes for 20 years every day. That is because of the pollution. So that's the kind of pollution that we, are, we, we want to reduce. I hope that is a useful answer to your question. Uh, one more question, sir. Uh, actually, I'm uh, running one small initiative for the Green Zone in Andaman Nicobar Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, since 2007, I'm working with the fishermen community. Mm -hmm. And most of the fishermen 
uh, they are using the kerosene or diesel in their uh, dinghy or in the fishing boat, in a uh, uh, small boat. Mm. So these are also creating pollution. Absolutely. So do you suggest any alternative for them? Do you suggest any alternative for there them? There is there is an organized because this, all the burn oil and this. Uh, there is there is an organization. Uh, there is a there is an organization hello? in. Some, I think it's in Chennai, if I'm not mistaken. But look it up. Look it up on the internet. It's called the International yeah. Collective in Support of Fishermen. Or Fisher Folk, as they call it. International? International Collective. International Collective? In the support yeah. of Fisher Folk. ICSF. In the support of Fisher Folk. Okay. Yeah. Look it up. Okay. Okay. They, will have, yeah. they will have many suggestions for sustainable fishing yeah. fishing methods and fishing techniques okay also i will what i will do okay, is thank you sir I, yes, I, sir. Please. not at all pleasure and what i will do is i will also um, if i can find where the chat is i don't know where the chat is i can put my email address and if anybody wants to uh, if anybody wants to so feel free to uh, drop me an email please share sir please yes, share your email ID, sir I've shared yeah. yeah okay any other thoughts any other question Anybody who wants to go with any of the questions can unmute themselves and go or raise your hand virtually. Uh, so I believe that we are not coming up with any question. Yeah, I have I have shared my my email address. So uh, those of you who feel uh, a little bit awkward asking a question, uh, I mean you should not feel awkward because a question is a public good. Uh, if you if you do a bit of uh, uh, environmental economics or economics, uh, a question is a public good because when you ask a question. Uh, other people who had also the same question in mind get answered, number one. That's the one benefit. Uh, and the second benefit is if I don't know the answer, to the, if I know the answer to the question, I will tell you the answer to the question. But if I don't know the answer to the question, then it will lead me to uh, look up, read more, do some research and find out the answer to the question. So everybody benefits. You benefit, I benefit, everybody benefits. You know. So a question is a public good. Thank you, Sneha. And uh, please uh, tell us what's happening tomorrow and we can... Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this inspiring topic and uh, simplifying, in fact, the complex concepts of uh, and, and the engaging topics as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, since uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll be having a session on concepts of sustainability, which will be taken up by Dr. Ram Buj. The link for the session will be shared tomorrow in the morning on the WhatsApp as well as on the email. I uh, hope to see you all tomorrow for the session. Uh, same time in the same place. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Thank you.